Welcome to Clocking In, Forces of NC Manufacturing. I'm your host, Phil Mintz, Director of the North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, otherwise known as NCMEP. My role is to drive outreach to NC manufacturers, build relationships to federal and state leaders, and coordinate efforts to drive profitable manufacturing growth in North Carolina. Throughout my time working closely with manufacturers, I have heard the most quirky, curious, and memorable stories. I wanted to turn these stories into a podcast so that others may hear and be informed and inspired. From humble beginnings to manufacturing titans, from tragedy to triumph, I will be interviewing some of these manufacturers who have made North Carolina manufacturing the powerhouse that it is today. North Carolina manufacturing has continued to operate throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, although not without a variety of challenges that continue to play havoc on their ability to provide the many products that consumers never really stop seeking to buy. Even as optimism increases with the continued reductions in the cases of the virus, the global economy still seems to be responding and adjusting to some of the longer term pandemic effects. Here to help us sort out some of the pieces as he sees them today is our good friend and the people's economist, Dr. Michael Walden. Dr. Walden is a William Niels Reynolds Distinguished Professor Emeritus from North Carolina State University. He graduated from Cornell University in 1978 with a doctorate in philosophy concentrating in consumer economics. While working at NC State University, Dr. Walden's role at NC State composed of teaching, research, and extension responsibilities in consumer economics, economic outlook, and public policy. He's an accomplished author who has published 11 books and over 300 articles and reports. Dr. Walden continues to be active in publishing, including his biweekly column, You Decide, which has carried over 40 newspapers in the state. So, Dr. Walden, welcome back. Thank you so much for speaking with us again today. Oh, my pleasure, Phil. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say first, clearly you're continuing to build quite a distinguished career, even in retirement. But what does a teaching economist do as a routine when the needs of the college students are not there? Well, uh, I set up an LLC, a limited liability corporation, meaning I do some consulting. I've had a steady stream of consulting from a variety of clients. I still do talks uh, to people, uh, being able to get some in-person talks, but most of them Zoom, but a variety of groups, uh, public groups, private groups. I still, as you indicated, do some things for the university. I do a column. I do some economic indices. I'm actually going to speak to the graduating class uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm still writing. I have a book coming, another book in February. But I think the difference uh, in retirement is if I want to take a nap at two o'clock, I can can do that. (laughs) I like being busy. My late father was like that. When he retired, he continued to, to work. He did different kind of work. He worked with his hands. He was a carpenter. I tell people that retirement doesn't mean you're, you're, you're not doing things, you're not productive, although certainly people who want to stop and, and lounge, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But for me, being active is, is really a necessary part of my life. So a year ago, you and I were speaking about how we mandated a recession Hmm. to kind of help us address the fears of what the virus might do to us, right? There was no vaccine at the time we talked before, but we had found ways to kind of move our economy forward. But looking at the economy in general and manufacturing specifically right now, it appears that we've returned to an economy that's so very different from the pre-pandemic. Let me start, like the number one and two challenges our manufacturers clients are telling us about, of course, are labor needs Mm -hmm. and supply shortages. So let's start there. I mean, what is your take on where we are today with the meeting the labor needs? Are there people out there for the jobs? Well, this is where some of the statistics are, are a little deceptive. The unemployment rate has come way down. We, we were under 4% before the pandemic. We went up in North Carolina to about 14%. We're now down to just above 4%. By that metric, you may say, well, gosh, why aren't we fully back? Well, the problem is we've lost a lot of people uh, being in what's called the labor force. If you're in the labor force, that means you either have a job or you're looking for work. And we're two percentage points down in that from pre-pandemic, which translate means we've got somewhere between 90 and 100,000 people that would have been in the labor force that are not now. And the big question among economists is why is that? And I think it's a variety of factors. I think some people are still afraid to go out and work because of COVID. Uh, Parents have some uh, issues with daycare, uh, whether schools will continue to be open. And then I think importantly, uh, retirements. 
we've had a lot of people who were retired, people who were still working. The pandemic came and they, I think they, uh, some, in some sense, what I went through, where they said, gosh, I'm, I'm 70 years old. Maybe I've got 15 good years to live. Do I want to do what I'm doing or do I want to do something else? The stock market has helped those people because it's gone up. So we've lost a lot of people in, in retirement. I do think that as time goes on and, the, and the, hopefully the virus recedes, we're going to get those 90 to 100,000 people who who aren't older like me come back into the labor force. So I think that's a short-term thing. And I think the supply chain are, is short-term, but I think short-term means not in a couple months. I'd say probably it's going to be another six months before we see those supply chains back. So we're going to have challenges in the months ahead. So in the meantime, with that supply chain, it's just so interesting to see the cargo ships off mm -hmm. the ports back there. And, and are we making any headways of maybe doing more things domestically or are we still heavily dependent on imports? Well, we're still heavily dependent upon imports, but that's a good point, when uh, Phil, when you mentioned challenges for manufacturing and, of course, uh, labor supply chain. I think another challenge, in a, in a sense, a good challenge, is I think there's been a lot of rethinking over the last year and a half about are we maybe too dependent upon other countries for a lot of what we buy? And I think I would predict that over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a lot of what I call reshoring. We're going to have some sectors come back to the U.S., particularly in manufacturing, and reignite themselves here with factories, et cetera. Probably the modern factory is going to be different than the, than the older factory, more technology, more automation, fewer people. But I do, th I do see an opportunity for manufacturing in North Carolina and manufacturing the nation to rebuild and for us to do some of those things that we are now rely upon other countries to do, to do those here at home. Just a little bit of a different topic. Well, today, I think there was a report released about inflation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think all of us have seen some of the effects of that already, just about everywhere you go, prices are higher. I mean, what is your take on what's going on there? I mean, well, is it related, I, yeah. is it related to the pandemic or anything like that? Yes. Uh, let me tell you something I learned 55 years ago when I took my first economics class. And we got to that section on inflation. I can remember the professor to this day saying, inflation results when you have too much money chasing too few goods and services. And we have that actually right now. Now, too few goods and services, we have the problem of the supply chain. We're not able to produce as much, particularly on the good side, as we did, whether it comes domestically or foreign. On the too much money, the Federal Reserve pumped a lot of money into the economy. The federal government pumped a lot of money into the economy over the next last year and a half. In fact, if you look at the bills that were passed in Congress during the Trump and Biden administrations that were focused directly on the pandemic, I'm not talking about the infrastructure bills, directly on the pandemic, $6 trillion. I can remember President Obama trying to keep his stimulus bill under $1 billion. We have had $6 billion. And I think the reason for that is we were in uncharted territory. No one knew how long this virus was going to last. No one knew how, it was going to, how deadly it was going to be. No one knew if we could get vaccines. I mean, our only reference point was over 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. That thing lasted three full years. So we've had a lot of money, however, pumped into the economy. People right now, Phil, are actually flush with cash, and they're trying to buy use it. They can't have the, they don't see the number of goods and services out there to buy. So essentially that's the reason we have higher inflation. I think the higher inflation will be temporary, but by temporary, I mean, probably another six months. Yeah. I think that's the question. I mean, when people talk about temporary, I mean, is that kind of what they mean by that? There's a lot of things people say, oh, it's temporary. Like the backup with the cargo ships, we think that's right. temporary. What? How long is that? Yeah. You have to say, well, how, <laughs> What, what is temporary? No, by, my, when I use temporary, I mean, this is something that's, this is not something that's going to be ingrained in our economy and last forever. Uh, but I do think temporary is not a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I think it's probably six months at least. So I think we're going to be dealing with these issues, hopefully not on such a pronounced level, but dealing with these issues well into 2022. One of the other things we talked about last time was the, the trade issues. And I think there's still things that are relatively quiet about our trade issues with China and maybe others. I mean, is there any new information on those fronts? 
Well, of course, the Trump administration really went to battle with the Chinese and, and levied a lot of tariffs on Chinese products. There was a sort of a deal at the end of the Trump administration, which didn't pan out the way many people thought. It's interesting to me, the Biden administration, of course, known for trying for overturning a lot of things that President Trump did, have kept, primarily kept his stance with China. They've kept a lot of those tariffs. That's obviously going to be the big geopolitical issue over the next several decades, the tension and competition between China and the US. I mean, you're, you're well aware that China uh, launched a, a missile system that apparently caught our people by surprise where it can, they can shoot a ballistic missile that doesn't go in a straight line, but it zigzags around. So it's very, very hard to shoot down. We have tensions with them over, over Taiwan. So the trade issue is still there. And it's going to be interesting to see, is, is President Biden going to be able to, to push that along and get some resolution? Because we still have a lot of issues with China over uh, theft of intellectual property, over borrowing some of our companies from doing business in China. Uh, some say that a lot of the products that, that are sold from China here, maybe they use, uh, they're artificially lower in price in order to capture our market. So a lot of those issues still maintain, are maintained. And I think this is where the two administrations seem to be uh, on the same level in terms of their issues and, and, and gripes with China. Yeah, along those same lines, you know, I guess sometimes we forget that since we have all the vaccines, we're probably one of the few countries that are all fully vaccinated and maybe our virus issues are not as bad as others. I mean, are we seeing things open up yet in terms of being able to do kind of interactions internationally? I mean, is there still challenges in other countries with the virus that's having effects? How is the global well, economy? Yeah, doing? well, we just, as you, as you probably know, just this week, the United States reopened for tourists, foreign tourists to come to the U.S. as long as they have proof of, of vaccination. So I think we're headed in, in, in the right direction there. But you're absolutely right to bring up some of the issues other countries have had. For example, in, in terms of supply chain, a lot of people don't recognize that the manufacturing center in Asia has gradually moved away, not totally away, but away from China to Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam. And Vietnam recently was, was still slammed by the virus and essentially shut down. They're only starting to reemerge. So yes, things that are happening in foreign countries vis-a-vis -vis the virus are still having an impact on us. So what does all this mean in terms of what's coming up for Christmas? You always <laughs> want to think about, you know, how that's going to happen. And, you know, you see all of these early Black Friday deals, mm -hmm. and it seems like there's this effort to try to get people to spend early yeah. this year. What, what, are, what are you seeing? Well, I, I mean, I'm probably not going to give people advice they haven't heard before, but I think obviously shop early certainly have alternatives. I do think people will be shopping. I think people need a release. I think the Christmas season, whatever religion or, or no religion you are, I mean, it's a joyous season. People are happy. So I do think people are out there. They're, they're going to want to spend and they have the cash to spend. But I think it's going to be the availability is going to be much more constrained than we've gotten used to in the past. And retailers, I think, know, of course, you know that m many retailers rely on Christmas sales to, to move them from profit or not profit. I think their problem is going to be, are they going to be able to open the hours that they need to be open because they can't find labor? So I think it's going to be a, a much kind of different Christmas, but I think overall it's going to be a positive and I think it'll be do good for our spirits. So are kind of online sales still kind of continue to overtake going into stores like it's, oh, yeah. it's trending. Yeah. Yes, yeah, online sales are jumping at double digit rates. I see no reason why they won't continue to do that. And I think looking ahead in this, because this is an area that's very much of interest to me, uh, how people acquire products and services. I think that one of the big game changers down the road is not necessarily going to be uh, online buying because people are already doing that. It's gonna be the delivery and it's gonna be the delivery with drones. And I think in five years, what you're going to see is a typical package or packages will be delivered to your house with drones. And what we're going to see municipalities do is set up drone lanes, uh, drone highways, if you will, in the skies, because it's going to have to be regulated in some way so we don't have these things bumping into each other. So I think that's going to be a big game changer down the road in terms of uh, commerce and in terms of retail sales is how those products and services get delivered 
to the person's homes. And in terms of services, I think what we're doing now, communicating via the computer, that's going to be changing in the future that as people are going to do more of their services. You already saw during the pandemic, people doing exercise, Peloton and others on online by, by using a trainer online and telemedicine which people, some people got a taste of during the pandemic, I think that's going to be much bigger in the future. So I think the pandemic, many have said that the pandemic is probably has, is, is going to be, whenever all said and done, going to compress the future, maybe the next decade into maybe a couple of years. Now, one of the areas that, you know, we continue to be of interest as an MEP is just, you know, the whole industry 4.0, automation, technology, and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it just seems to be that some of the smaller manufacturers are slow to adopt some of this technology. I mean, what do you think is going to be the thing that kind of breaks that through? I know some of the larger companies are moving forward, but well, like well, well, some yeah, some of this is constrained in North Carolina. If you're not in the metro areas where inter Internet service is, is good, uh, you, everyone knows that we do have a urban rural divide. And we, everyone knows that if you have you need Internet service. Uh, in rural areas, it's, it's not going to be as robust. Uh, I think the latest data I saw was 25% of North Carolinians don't even have access to internet. This is another change I think we're going to see. For example, in the infrastructure bill that was passed last week, there's $62 billion at the federal level to expand an internet service. So I think that's going to help. The other thing is that I think how internet service is provided is going to change. People have heard the name Elon Musk. He is developing something called Starlink, which is going to ring the globe with low orbiting satellites, meaning the reception and connectivity is going to be much better. That he claims once this is all done, anyone in the, on the globe will be able to get high speed, reliable Internet service. And he's supposedly going to roll the first version of this out next year. So I'm optimistic that we're going to see Internet, reliable Internet service. Uh, just like electricity was 100 years ago, a reliable internet service come to rural areas. And I think that's going to be a spark plug for development of our, of our rural counties. And I think it's going to help a lot of manufacturers who perhaps for a variety of reasons want to be in, in rural areas. Perhaps they need the, the space, the land, et cetera. I think that that's going to be a big game changer for our state economy. Finally, let's, let's focus a little bit on the outlook for North Carolina. You know, it just seems to be amazing. I think throughout all of this, I was talking to our friends at Economic Development. We mm -hmm. still continue to see companies coming in here, setting up shop and doing business, making things in North Carolina. I mean, what's really driving all that? I guess, is it still just the demand that you spoke about earlier? Well, North Carolina, of course, for decades, it's been a growing state, growing faster than the nation. What happened during the pandemic, I think, was pretty amazing. If you look at, of course, all states suffered, including North Carolina. But if you look at North Carolina on two major metrics, COVID deaths per capita and job loss per capita, we were low compared to all other states. We were, I think, 13th from the bottom. And we were lower than any of the states in our immediate area. So the bottom line is, I think North Carolina has come out of this pandemic being viewed by many as a safe state. And for people and businesses who, after the pandemic, want to move, and then you hear a lot about people not happy in their particular state, they want to get out after the pandemic. I think North Carolina is going to be a destination for many of them. So I'm actually predicting our growth rate after the pandemic is going to accelerate above what it would have been without the pandemic. Wow, that's just uh, incredible. We, we've done a great job with the virus, I think, considering all things. And so mm -hmm. it's good, yeah. good to hear that people want to come this way. We can talk more about economic thrillers now. You got one, you got <laughs> one you're working on right now? Uh, I, I don't. I've got some ideas, but I don't. Uh, the next book I've got coming out in, uh, in February is uh, looking at how the post-pandemic economy will affect families. And I look at all the issues and challenges families are facing and talking about some of this internet technology being everywhere, the ability to remotely work, delivery of products, education, services via the internet, how that could change family life for those who want to change and change it for the positive. So that'll be out in February and the book's called Relaunch. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, that you mentioned that. I, I just saw an article today that kind of talked about the phases of a pandemic when it's, when it's post-pandemic, and people are talking like 2023 before they can officially say you're in mm -hmm. post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I guess we're still not really where they want us to be in terms of the herd immunity and all of that. 
So right, but technia, and I'm, and I think you're absolutely right. I think we'll still be worried about the virus in 2022, but now we are hearing about pills rather than a shot that'll be available. So yeah, I think for for a year or two, we're probably going to have to all get re reboosted, if you will, either through a shot or a pill or something, and, and maybe be cautious about large groups, et cetera. But to, to my mind, we're certainly better off now than we were a year ago, and hopefully we're headed, we're headed in the right direction. And uh, economically, you know, help me if I'm wrong, I think North Carolina plays into a lot of some of these pandemic-related you know, medical responses or drugs oh, sure. or things like that. I think there are great with big pharmaceutical sector. Uh, technology plays into that. Other manufacturers play into that. Yes. So uh, we've got, uh, we, we certainly are research universities with, uh, with research and perhaps how to deal with future pandemics and viruses. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of people looking at North Carolina as the place to do this kind of research and do this kind of business. Absolutely. So we're fortunate to be in this great state. and we're- Oh, I think so. I mean, I'm not a native, but I've been here 43 years. And the longer I'm here, the more impressed I am with North Carolina. And, and it has dramatically changed over the last four, four decades. But yes, it is a state to certainly be watchful of and, and notice. And, and people do. I mean, we are, on, we, are, we are certainly on the map. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you here as well, uh, Dr. Walden. You're our people's economist. Oh, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And, uh, and we're thankful that you we take out a little bit of your time to talk oh, to us. Any, any, anytime, Phil. Thank because you. Because you're very, very helpful to us. And continue success in all your writing and speaking and, and your business engagements as you move forward. Thank you very much, Phil. Great to talk to you. Thank you for joining today's Clocking In, Voices of NC Manufacturing. This podcast is brought to you by NC State's College of Engineering, the North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and Industry Expansion Solutions. If you'd like to learn more about the solutions NCMEP offers, go to www.ncmep.org. Want to listen to previous Clocking In podcasts? Go to ncmep.org slash clockingin.org.